Um, there's a scene in the movie Forrest Gump, um, everybody's favorite movie, right? Um, where Forrest finds out that he has a son with Jenny. Um, if you remember, if you know the movie, you'll remember this scene. Um, and I just want you to know, I had to work really hard to not say Jenny like Forrest did as I was saying her name. Um, I had to work really hard. I wrote it in my notes, don't say it like Forrest. Um, it's actually in there. I can show you later. Um, but he has this son that he finds out later, like that he had with Jenny. He goes into the house and she tells him, like, this is your son. Um, and he starts to get emotional and he's trying to figure out, like, is he smart? Is he not smart? And he's, he, he, it's just this emotional scene as he's trying to figure out what his role is going to be in this, this son's life. Um, and he asks, can I go sit with him? And Jenny says, yes, please go. Um, and he goes and he sits down next to his son and they're watch he's watching TV, asks him what he's watching. Um, and as he sits down, the director's put in this little clip in this, in this scene, or this little detail in the scene, which is so fascinating. They sit down at the TV together and at the same exact time, uh, in an exact same way, they both tilt their head together at the same, like the same way. And it's almost this ode um, uh, of the director saying like, hey, we, no matter what your life has looked like, a lot of us, l l I guess, act and live like our parents. Um, I don't know uh, if you've had that, that oh, oh no moment where you realize that you start saying the things that your dad says and said growing up. You know those things? Like you start to realize like your entire job as a dad is to turn off all the lights in the house and make sure all the doors are shut. So the AC doesn't get out. Uh, you start to say little phrases, right, um, that, that your dad said. And you're like, ooh, I don't like that I say that now. But I'm at that age, I guess, where it starts coming out. Uh, there's this reality that we, we are like our parents. And things are passed down through us through our DNA. Things are passed down to us um, through what, what, what they call like our ethos, like how we see the world, how the world was shaped for us. That we pick up on things, right? Like if you're a hard worker and you're disciplined and, and, and how you do certain things around the house, a lot of that comes from your upbringing, your parents, and you start to act like them and live like them uh, over time. Uh, and today, as we look at um, this passage in 1 John, John gives us a glimpse into what it is like and what the expectations are for the family of God. What are the expectations for the family of God? He gives us some really strong words uh, of what it looks like to how the family of God should live. And if you are new with us, we have been in a study on the letters of John over the last few weeks. Um, looking at this letter, we took a break last week, but uh, these letters that John writes are to these churches that look to John as, his, as their leader. This is, they call them in the, in the, the theology world, these Joannine communities. Uh, they are churches that look to John and say like, hey, you are, you are a leader. We, we're looking to you for guidance and leadership. And what you have taught us and what you have discipled us in, we're going to teach others. Uh, that is the idea of these churches. And there's these false teachers that have, have risen up around his churches and start to teach false doctrine. So the entire purpose of the letter is to correct false doctrine, to warn his church, to warn these people like, hey, this is the way of the kingdom. Don't listen to the false teachers. Okay, so we got to remind ourselves of that often, because if we don't know the context and the reason that the story was written, then we can easily uh, make it about ourselves. We can easily uh, take it uh, a different way than what John originally intended. And so um, uh, this is a response to the false teachers. First John chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning, and then we're going to read verses 1 through 10 today. First John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And this is what it says. Uh, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. For the, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him, speaking of Jesus. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children. There's that. He keeps all throughout this book, he's writing like dear children, beloved. There's like this care and love for his people that he's writing. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous, as Jesus is righteous. 
Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Last one, verse 10. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, really strong words again, and uh, I'm going to be really honest with you this morning, is that this series has been really tough to teach. The reason is, it feels like there's, there's no passage in here that's like, hey, we're going to give this really encouraging passage to, to the church today. It's all very heavy hitting, right? It feels like, like every week is just like the sledgehammer of like, hey, don't stray from the truth. Like the, the sin is sin. God is right. Like we need to follow God. Get away from sin. That's what it feels like this entire letter to me. Uh, and it's been, it's been a little bit difficult, a little bit heavy, but that's the beauty of going verse by verse is that we don't get to pick and choose. And uh, we, we, we look at these scriptures and we say, okay, what is God saying to us? We pick this book and we say, let's just let the word of God speak to us. And I think um, there's not a, a more important time in our culture um, than the moment that we are right now than to hear the words that John, had been, John was writing to his people and what we need to hear for our times today. Um, you think, obviously, uh, this is not to be uh, sla a slam, but we know it's all in our face, right? This is the month of June. We know what the month of June is. If you haven't, you've been living under a rock, right? Um, if, you, if not, then you, you've seen things at stores or you're boycotting stores or you're, um, you know, you're doing certain things because it's, it's Pride Month, right? And so we're, we're trying to figure out, like, how, what is our place in this world? How do we stand for truth and right living, um, but also be loving and caring for those that don't believe like what we believe? There's this tension that we are living in in this time and this day. Uh, and if we are not careful, as we have seen already, the beliefs of the world will begin to infiltrate the church in the name of love and of acceptance, and we've got to be careful to pay attention to what we, are, what we are hearing. So here is the main idea this morning, if you're taking notes, and if you don't get anything else, I want you to leave with this, is that we have been adopted into God's family and called to live like God's children. We have been adopted into God's family, but we have been called to live like God's children. Let's look at um, verse 1 of chapter 3, when he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us. How we as humans love is fascinating to me um, because our love is, um, is complicated, right? Yeah, you know that love is complicated. Uh, we know that our love as humans is incomplete, is it not? Right? Like, uh, you know, like when we counsel people to get married and we, we, one of the things we tell them is like, hey, don't tell your spouse that, that they complete you. They don't, right? That, that is a job and a responsibility only for the Lord. Right? And so we, we've got to be careful, like the things that we say, like we know that our human love is, it falls short, right? We're going to disappoint others. We're going to disappoint our children. Our children are going to disappoint us. We're going to disappoint our spouse, our extended family. Our human love falls very short. Um, one of the best marriage resources out there is the, the five love languages. If you've not done that as a couple, I'd, we encourage you to do it. It helps couples learn like what their kind of love is. And um, to be honest, um, it, it, it's, it can be difficult, right? Because uh, many times when you're married to your, the spouse that you're married to, uh, you're, their, their love language is different than your love language, right? And so if, if your spouse's love language is, uh, let's just say quality time, um, yours might be um, uh, gifts, right? Like you got to learn how to love your spouse, how they enjoy to be loved. You got to fill that love bank up, so to speak, in your marriage. That's what they talk about all the time. If you're not familiar with it, there's acts of service, physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, and gifts. Um, and typically, like I said, you, this, this love language can be different than your partner's. And the goal is that you want to love your spouse, care for them, help, help them to feel loved. But even in our best efforts, what do we do? We miss the mark. If, you're, if your spouse's love language is words of affirmation and they do something really good, you're going to be busy at, it, at something and you're going to miss telling them, hey, you did so good at that thing. If, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if their love language is quality time and you've had a busy week, you don't even acknowledge sometimes like, hey, it's been a really busy week. We need to just sit on the couch together and have a conversation tonight. We're going to miss it. We're going to fail. Uh, your parents, we know this, right? 
I think we come to this realization uh, as we get a little bit older, we start to realize that our parents are not as perfect as we thought they were because they're humans. And then you start parenting your own children and you're like, I get it. Right? Like, I get why they're not perfect because I, I can quickly see my imperfections. But John is calling our attention to this different kind of love. And he says, what kind of love that the Father has given us? In the Greek, that word what, it means what country. And he's saying, it's, it's almost like the, the love that, that God is talking about here is foreign to us. It's different. The, 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 the comment, one of the commentaries I was reading said that, uh, that this, what John is saying is that this love of God is not just great, that it's otherworldly. What love that he has given to us. It, it's it's otherworldly that in our, in our carnal minds we can't comprehend that kind of love because we, in our humanity, we see the failures of our own love. But it's not only just that good. What John says is so sweet. He says he's, he's freely given it to us that you've done nothing to earn his love. You've not obeyed your way into his love. He just simply loves you. <clears throat> Let's continue in verse one. And he says that we should be called children of God. And so we are. We should, we should be called children of God. One of the songs that we sang to our kids as they were smaller, the like little, little babies and maybe one, maybe two years old, as we would sing Jesus loves little children to them all the time. Classic, simple, but yet profound. If there's one thing that we want our kids to know when they leave our house is that God's love for them is greater than they could ever imagine. Um, this verse is one of the most, to me, one of the most beautiful truths of the Bible of what God has done for us, um, that he would call us his children. And I want you to think, for a moment, just think with me for a moment, uh, not to shame yourself, but I want you to think with me for the, for the reality setting uh, of our own souls, uh, of your own brokenness in your humanity. Think about it for a moment. Think about how you failed this week. Anybody fail this week? Today, this morning on the way to church? Anybody willing? No? All right. Some of your best spousal arguments will happen on the way to church, won't they? Think about your own brokenness, how, you've, how you have failed God over and over. Think about how you have so easily been distracted. We have been so easily distracted by the pursuit of the world. And we put the things of the kingdom off to the back burner in, in, in name of success and prosperity. How easily we do those things. Yet all of those things that God knows about us, yet he says, you're still my children. It's a different kind of love. He's been a, adopted us into his family, and we tend to gloss over things like this because it can feel elementary uh, when you think about, hey, you're, you're a child of God. Sure, okay, great. I want you to think about it for a moment. It's so rich that God could have paid for our sins and wiped our slate clean and said, you're saved and you're good to go. You're no longer going to be in eternal damnation. And he could have left it at that, but he didn't because his love is so good. That he didn't leave us just at, just, at, just at forgiveness, but he says, not only are you forgiven, but I'm going to bring you into my family and adopt you into my family. There's this love and this tenderness and this care of the Father that we're seeing John write. And he's like, listen, you are children of God. Do you understand what he has done for you? It's not just, it's not just salvation. It's, it's, it's deep, even deeper than that. It's like salvation is the greatest need, yes, but man, he's called you family and a child of, the God, of, of God, the creator of the universe. And he continues and says, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The reason why the world did not know us um, is that the world did not know him. This, this word here that he talks about world um, is the word cosmos. Uh, John is uh, equating um, the, the word cosmos to the unbelieving world. Okay, so he's saying uh, the world, the unbelieving world does not know him or did not know him and it does not know you. Um, just as the world rejected Jesus, that the world is going to reject you. Uh, and here's this, there's this, uh, to me, there's this dichotomy here that we're, that we're going to read about. Um, we know the challenges of life, right? We know that there are things that are going to happen where the world will reject what we believe or what we say or what the word of God says, right? But what, that, what that's not saying is that we should become this kind of victim mentality. I want to be very clear. Um, if we think that we are in the middle of persecution, we have a rude awakening coming. 
persecution is when you're hiding for your life in the, in the basement, holding on to nothing but a Bible, knowing that you could, your life could be taken from you because you just have a Bible in your hand. That's persecution. Now, are there cultural things that we don't like that are happening? 100%. And that's okay. But we got to be careful to not equate persecution to things that we don't agree with from a, from a theological standpoint. And, and many people have, have equated that and they've bought into this lie that, hey, we're, we're the victims of our world. I don't know about you, but I don't like being a victim. I don't think God has called us to be a victim. So we got to be careful to not equate what John is saying here to make sure that we're not being victims. Uh, but here's what I would tell you. We should not be surprised when the world doesn't understand what we believe and why, do we, why we believe it. Just as somebody of another faith, we may, we may not believe uh, what, a, what a Muslim believes, right? What somebody, like a, a Mormon believes. We don't believe what they believe. We don't understand why they believe what they believe. And so we can so easily get caught up in like everybody should believe what we believe. And, every, and, and so we just get into this mentality of uh, that we're, we're, and we believe that we're right. So please don't misunderstand me and leave here and think Derek doesn't know doctrine. That's not what I'm saying. We so easily get into this world of like, we're the right ones and everybody else is wrong. And, we, and, and so it's kind of us against them mentality. The world will not always understand why we stand for what we stand for. Because they don't know God and they don't really know us. There's this theme that is woven throughout the scriptures that we can easily forget in our Western American minds and, and culture. Is that you are not a citizen of this earth. Where is your primary citizenship? Where is your primary citizenship? Exactly. Let's remind ourselves of that November next year, right? We got to remind ourselves of that. We care about our country. We care about our world, right? We got to make sure that we know where our first citizenship is. But God, in his mercy, and amongst all the chaos that is going on in this world, he has handpicked you for this time, this moment, and says, I want them to be in this earth for my mission, for my glory. Let's look at verse 2. Let me, let me, let me just say this as, I, as we make our way to verse 2. Um, with all this stuff that we see that's going on, we have to stand firm on God's word but we have to do it in love. And we can do both, right? I wanna give you that pastorly shepherding advice. We can do both. We can stand firm in our love and we can or stand firm in our beliefs and we can do it in love. God has not called us to be cultural warriors. We gotta be careful how we say things and what we're talking about when we talk about it. Okay, verse two, that's enough. I've made enough people mad already. Beloved, we are... God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he sees. There is a lot of misconceptions about the afterlife that we have in our culture. Uh, we don't become little baby angels with wings, right? We say things at funerals like fly high and um, somebody gain their, gain their wings. And we say that out of comfort and love for people, but we just have to know that like, that is not what the Bible says. We don't, we don't become angels. We don't become spirits. We will have our resurrected bodies in heaven with us. And so if we're not careful, this verse as well can bring, bring a little bit of confusion when he says that uh, we, um, what, what will become is not yet. And we, when Jesus returns, we will be like him. What John is not saying is that you are going to become like Jesus in the sense that he is a God. That he is God. John is not saying that you're going to become little gods. That would be similar to Mormonism, right? That says if you're good enough and you're holy enough and you do enough works in this world, um, that you can be a God of your own planet. I know that we like to think that everybody agrees with us, right? And Mormons are very, very good about twisting the truth just enough to make sure you think that, hey, they're, they're, they're Christians. I would just be clear, they're not. Okay? So and they're knocking on your door. They know their stuff. Just trust me, right? Y'all ever had a conversation with them? They know, their, they, know their, they know their books. They study more than Christians study. We gotta be careful. 
But John is saying, you're not, become, you're not becoming little gods. But John is saying that when we see Jesus, we're going to go from our human nature, our brokenness, hurting, failing in health, all the things that we experience, you're going to go from that to purity and wholeness. When you see him, you're going to become like him. It's an incredible thought. We're going to go from brokenness to purity and wholeness. A life where there's no more battle between flesh and spirit, no more temptation, no more battle of right versus wrong, evil versus good. A life where there's no more unexpected doctor reports, no more sickness that ravages the human body. We're going to be like him in a state, in his presence. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to a world in a time of eternity where I don't have to worry about the battle between flesh and spirit. Where I don't have to worry about the difficulties of life and the, the pressures and the weights and the burdens that we put on ourselves. I'm looking forward to that. Verse 3. And everyone who puts their hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who puts their hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Hope is a word that we misuse in our day, isn't it? Um, you might be hoping right now because we're only in verse 3 and we got to go, go to verse 10. You might be hoping that I finish up so you can get to lunch and there's not a long wait at the restaurant. Right? There's this, uh, I hope that my sports team wins. Right? There is, we see hope in our world as wishful thinking. Um, but biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It's assurance. It's, it's, it's solid, it's, 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 it's the rock that we hold on to. Uh, and, and so we've got we to make sure that we know what we're talking about. He says that there's a hope in him, uh, and we're not wishing, but we know what is waiting for us. And so John here is talking about this future hope, um, and we put our hope in him, and he purifies us so much so that we will be pure like Jesus. Now, we know, and I'm harping on this a lot this morning because John is harping on it, we know that it is impossible for us on this earth to live a life that is as pure as Jesus. We can't go an hour, probably, if not minutes, without living something that Jesus wouldn't do, right? If you don't believe me, let me, let me, let me just say this. Uh, try working on an area of your life where you're failing this week. Maybe it's uh, anger. Uh, that, that is, that's something that I'm working on personally. I get frustrated at little stupid things. Um, and so I'm working on my anger. Um, but let's just say you, you're going to say, I'm going to work on my anger this week. Um, Ten minutes later on your drive to work, you're going to be stuck in bumper to bumper traffic. And your anger is going to be what? Tested. You might have a thought like, hey, I'm going to be more patient with my coworkers this week. You're not going to get an hour into the day, are you? Anytime you start to focus on something, you know you're going to be tested on it. That's why I'm like, I want to be careful what I preach. Because every time I preach something, I feel like the Lord's like, okay, Derek, here you go. <laughs> we can't go a day, hours, minutes without seeing our humanity in full view. But soon, we'll see it fade. Isn't that a beautiful thought? No more struggle. No more pulling. No more stretching from one side to the other. John Stott says it this way. He says, Christians who fix their hope, their confident expectation upon Christ's return will purify themselves, not ceremonially, but morally. This is big. This is so good. I want you to remember back to the sacrificial system that they had in, the, in uh, really still the time of Jesus. Um, uh, ended around 70 AD uh, when the temple was destroyed. Uh, but really, for most of the Old Testament, the way that God would allow people to approach him and to worship him, right, is they had to be ceremonially clean. And so they would have, if you go to Jerusalem today, you you'd see all these, uh, all these mikvahs. They're like a baptismal pool, so to speak. They have an a unclean entrance and a clean entrance. And to be able to sacrifice to the Lord on the temple mount, they would have to go into this mikvah, this, this baptismal pool on the dirty side, cleanse themselves ceremonially, come out of the clean side, so much so that if you clean yourself and you're walking up the, la walking up the stairs and you brush up against the unclean, you have to go through the whole process again. This is the idea that, 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 uh, of how, how to approach God is, was to be more ceremonially clean, is that they had to purify themselves. Then they would put on clean clothing. And then they had to have this pure lamb that they could sacrifice on the altar. 
then and only then could they sacrifice, or then and only then could they worship God. But all of that is only in ceremony. And John says, John Stott, as John Stott says, is that when we see Jesus and we hope, put our hope in him and we see him for the next time, not only are you ceremonially clean, but you are morally clean. There will be nothing in you that will want to do anything other than the will of God. That's a good thought. That's a good truth that we could hold on to of what future is going to look like, that we're going to be so clean that it's even morally. Let's look at verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. This is, this is a very, very important distinction that I want to give you here for a second. Um, the difference between sinning and practicing lawlessness. Uh, if we are not careful, this, this verse, a verse like this, can turn us towards legalism. If we are not careful, it will turn us towards legalism that says uh, you have to obey in a certain way to earn the favor and right relationship with the Father. It, it's, where we take, it's where we take Christianity and we make it a list of to-dos and don'ts. This is what can happen if we are not careful. Is that we say uh, it, 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 that the difference between sinning and practicing lawlessness. Uh, while it is true, and I've said many times that we as followers of Jesus cannot out the grace of God. It is also true that if you really love God, it is not your practice to want to sin. Do you feel that tension, that weight? What John is saying here, he's, he's talking about that, that grace has you covered. But sin is still serious. John equates it to lawlessness. Like when you live a life of practicing sin, that you are living a life of lawlessness. I think we've, over the last couple of years, we've seen maybe on the news some certain cities that thought it would be a great idea to do that, right? It doesn't seem to turn out very well. Lawlessness, I want you to hear me, lawlessness is not the result of sinning. Lawlessness is the root of sinning. We think and we tend to think that if I sin enough, then it becomes lawlessness. And what John is saying is that no, sin is so serious that the root of sin is lawlessness. You, you, you want to go, you want to go completely opposite to the will and the, the care of God. You want to step outside of his his loving care, his shepherding care. It, it's, it's our desire to, to control life on our own many times that gets us outside of that will of God. Sinning is lawlessness. It's turning away. It's rebellion against God. And so when we live in sin, we are living antithetical to the call of God in our life. Now, this is this is verse five and six, five, six, and seven are going to kind of give us some little bit of clarification because I know we're talking really strong and really hard on sin this morning. And it, you might be thinking, like, wow, like this is this is this is this is hard. But here's here's the distinction. Verse five. He says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him uh, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous, as Jesus is righteous. This is the weight of sin that John is talking about here, is that in our modern times of grace, we can sometimes forget the cost that it, that it, the cost that it cost God, excuse me, I couldn't figure out a better way to say that in my mind, what it costs God uh, to pay for sin. We can sometimes forget that, that Jesus gave his life. We just celebrate it with communion. He gave his life for our sins willingly. That is what it costs God. And John is calling to the mind of the readers and he's like, you know the truth. We've, we've preached the truth to you. We've been preaching this to you from the beginning. Cost God everything. Remember back to the context of the letter. The false teachers, as they've come and they're they're saying, "Hey, it's okay because you have Jesus." And so, for here on out, here on out, what you do and how you live doesn't matter. And John says, "Yes, it matters. How you live makes a difference because when you live outside of the will of God, what you're saying is, I've got this on my own, God. I don't need you.'" And John's saying, no, this is not the way. Let's continue to look at verse 6. And he says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who abides in him 
keeps on sinning. Um, this abiding word, abiding in Christ, um, John is kind of weaving this throughout the entire book. Every, every passage, it seems like he's bringing up this word abide. Uh, it can be summarized like this. Um, and, and what John is saying is that the more time you spend with Jesus, the more that you're going to become like him and the less that you're going to become like the world. To, to simplify it as possible as I can, the more time you spend with Jesus, the more that you're going to become like him and the less, like, less, less you're going to become like the world. We have to make sure that our obedience is an overflow, a natural response to our closeness with him. The problem comes in is that when we start with a list, if we start with a list and we say, here are the things that we do and here are the things that we don't do, we have totally missed who Jesus is. Our obedience is an overflow. It is not the foundation. We have to really make that distinction clear for ourselves to make sure that when we mess up, because we will, we're going to we're gonna fail. We're gonna, something big is going to happen in your life at some point that's like, wow, never thought I'd find myself in this situation. The grace of God is there for you. But we also have to know that when we live a life that is anti to the way of Jesus, it matters to the Lord. If we start with abiding, sitting, leaning into, uh, we will see ourselves become more like him. It's a, it's a natural response. It's the fruit of the spirit, isn't it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, right? Like the things that we strive for aren't things that we make a list of in a checkbox and say, oh, hey, I think I got self-control down now. It comes only through abiding. It comes only through sitting with him, only, only spending time in prayer with him. There's no other way to get it. There's no, there's no Christian bookstore that's going to sell you the box set, right? And that's the, that's the challenge of the way of Jesus is that we live in such a time where we want everything to happen immediately, right? Take this pill, do this program, do that, and oh, oh all your problems are solved. There is no fast way of the kingdom. It's slow. God can move fast, but becoming like him is slow, isn't it? You're going to take 10 steps forward. You're becoming like Christ, right? You're, you're, you're growing in your Christ-likeness. Things are going well. And then all of a sudden you have a week where it's like, man, this is not going good for me. Let's look at verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Um, it's pretty clear where John makes it like, hey, where does sin come from? It comes from the devil. When we sin, what John is equating this to, he's saying, you are doing the works of the devil. Does this mean that when you sin or you slip or you fall, that you are now a part of some dark kingdom? No. Because if you have trusted in Jesus, I want to make this abundantly clear this morning, is that if you have trusted in Jesus, your salvation is secure. What can happen is that um, this, can be, this can be something where you feel like your, your salvation is unsecure. This is the, the, the tradition that I grew up in. I felt like I had to get saved 40 times. Because I made a mistake that week and I've got to go to the altar and do it again. John is drawing a, a, sand, a line in the sand again, though, here. And he's saying, you're either doing the works of the kingdom or you're doing the works of the enemy. It's black and white. What do we like to do, though? We like to live in the gray area, don't we? We like to have just a little bit, of, maybe not a lot of gray, but maybe a little bit. That's, that's how we tend to live, isn't it? Um, I want to be clear with this, is that if the Bible is clear on an issue, we sh it should not be gray to us. If the Bible, the word of God is clear on an issue, it should not be gray to us as followers of Jesus. Let's look at, um, continue to look at it. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Uh, if the reason that Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil, then why should we want to do the works of the devil? You feel the weight of what John is saying here? He's like, this is, the, this is what it costs God. It costs him his son. Like if, 
if that is what it costs God, then why would we as followers of Jesus want to be a part of that? Not, not mistakes, right? He's saying practicing lawlessness, practicing sinful life, living a life of sin, anti to the ways of Jesus. So what are some areas that we might live in some gray areas? I'll give a few examples so I can really make just everybody mad this morning. Wasn't that, that, you remember back in the day, like when preachers, it was like, it felt like a good day when the pre- preachers beat everybody up with the word of God, you know? It's like, that's not what I'm trying to do, but that's kind of where it's leaning this morning. I'm sorry. Uh, gossip, right? We love a good juicy story, don't we? I love a good juicy story. Y'all act like y'all don't. Let's be honest this morning. We like a good story, don't we? We're like, ooh, I think I overheard that. Mm, I want to hear what that is about. You don't believe me? At lunch today, you're going to hear the person behind you at the booth saying something, and you're like, you catch yourself leaning back a little bit. What are they saying? There's a temptation, right? But that's a gray area. The Bible's clear on it, but what do we do? We're like, well, we're going to make it a prayer request. It's a gray area. This is, this is a cultural one, all right? Drunkenness. No, no more laughing? We just wanted, <laughs> do you feel the tension? It was like, oh. <laughs> Evidently, we need to talk about it more. <laughs> Listen, a, as new covenant believers, I want, I want to, uh, just some clarity here. What I believe, what we believe here, the Lord has given you freedoms to enjoy things in this world. Um, I think there's actually probably a little bit more evidence for drinking wine in the Bible than against it. But there is plenty of warning. Y'all hear me? There's plenty of warning. As followers of Jesus, drunkenness should not be a part of our life. And so what do we do? What's the gray area? We, we keep moving the line down, right? We're like, what drunkenness actually is? Well, I can function. That's a pretty low bar, right? <laughs> you feel the gray area? It's like it, it, we could go on and on and hit on and on today of how we, like, things that the Bible is clear on that we can easily find ourselves of, like, hey, we have got to, like, we've got to, like, we got to catch up on this gray area. There's no more gray area. Let's look at verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident that we who are, chil- who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Man, again, keep it going, John, right? He's just bringing it heavy. Um, some will take this, again, they're going to they're take verses like this and utilize it as a way to say that your salvation is not secure. It's not what he's saying. Um, but he is being a little bit over the top in a sense. And what he's saying is this, is that if you are a follower of Jesus and you abide in him, living a life of sin is not, the, not, the life, not in line with the word of God. He's, he's being a little, bit, a little bit over the top. He's saying no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And then he goes on. It, it's evident who the children of God are. Isn't that fascinating? That John is saying like, hey, it should be evident to the church community and to your overall community who the followers of God are. Why? Because they're obedient to the word of God, which means we're obedient to God. And what's the, what's the next thing that he tells us? I want, you to be, I want you to love your brother, as he says in verse 10. That we should be righteous living, but also caring for our brother and sister. There's this thing that John is kind of going back and forth here. And it's like, man, this, this, is, this, this is important. Obedience to God and his word is the evidence of our salvation, not the cause of our salvation. Obedience to God and his word is the evidence of our salvation, not the cause of it. What would we say in our culture? Maybe, maybe evidence of being, being saved is that we go to church on a weekly basis. 
might be something that we hold on to, right? Like we value the Sunday gathering. That's important. But that's not the evidence. Um, maybe, we, maybe, maybe we equate our salvation. Um, I know this sounds outrageous, but we see it in our culture today. We equate our salvation with a political party. We equate our salvation with um, staying away from big things, big sinful things. What does he say? No, your obedience is about, your, your obedience is your, is your evidence of your salvation, how you obey, how you love others, how you obey the God, word of God. Remember back to Forrest Gump sitting at the TV with his son. And they instantly do the same thing, tilt their heads at the same way. John is saying, if you're walking with him, our lives will start to look like him. That's where abiding comes in. That's where abiding comes in, is that if we are following God and we're following his word, that our lives will begin to look like his life. Up until the moment that he returns and then we find purity and completeness. Not, not ceremonially, not on the outside. We're not cleansing outside when Jesus comes back. We're cleansed from top to bottom, inside and out. But until that moment comes, God is saying, I want you to be a light in our world that has gone mad, right? That we feel and we see and we know. I want you to be a light in the world to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Not for your own glory, but for mine. We've been adopted into God's family and we are called to live like God's children. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning.